Good afternoon, everyone. I have a sign-up sheet here for those who would like to get on our list for, for taking the course for credit, and you can pass that around. Our speaker today, Judith Donath, is somebody who has a huge influence on human-computer interaction. In 2014, I think it's pretty obvious to say that the social experience of the web, in many ways, is what the web is all about. I mean, that's why we spend so much time on the web, maybe even more than we should sometimes. And this was not at all obvious in the early days of the web. And um, I think that, that Judith is, in many ways, the first person to really see the web as being a setting for social interaction and to try and figure out well, if all of us are just on the other side of a computer screen, how do you get a sense of literally who's there? Uh, and her book goes into a, a bunch of stuff about this. It's really great, and uh, they're even set up right outside. Um, you know, through this pioneering work, she's advised a number of PhD students who I bet you know their work also, folks like Dana Boyd and Karen Caraquilios and uh, Fernanda Villegas. And again, in 2014, we look at like our polarization maps, and we say, well, there's the, the red side over here and the blue side over here. And visualization has become part of the everyday landscape. Now the New York Times employs people who do visualization as journalism. And this just was not at all obvious uh, 20 years ago when Judith started this work. And it's especially amazing because I was doing research at the time, and I can remember wondering, well, this whole bit, I have a lot of friends in the visualization community, and I remember wondering, like, is this going to go anywhere? Or really, is, is drawing pictures just for scientific data, and the rest of the stuff just, just isn't going to turn out to be much? And what's been amazing is that the, the pressing work that, that Judith and her students and other collaborators have done has really made a visual language for talking about sociality on the web. And so I personally am really excited to have Judith here today. Well, thank you. That was quite an introduction. Thank you very much. So um, what I'll be talking about today is a variety of work that my students and I had done in the past, but I'm going to talk about it with the lens or the framing of, in particular, looking at some of the deeper ethical and social questions and about how different decisions we make as designers change the social experience in ways that we do and do not foresee. And what I wanted to start with is just one example. In particular, I'm interested in this notion for today of framing, of how when you design an interface, one of the things that's really interesting about the social world online is that because there's no actual physical reality, everything you do is designed, and everything is built to some extent on metaphor. And as you bring in these metaphors, the, you know, once you're, you're not de once you're dealing with an abstract world, to make it perceptible, you have to use metaphor to some extent. And once you bring in metaphors, you start bringing in the metaphor's cousin and its second cousin and all the other baggage that comes with them. And when, often what happens is the metaphor itself starts to shape how things are seen. And so um, with this example, this is a library card. And you know, some of you may nev have never seen these, but in fact, you used to sign books out and, and everything. But today, this information is some of the most protected information. You cannot go to a library. Librarians are very into protecting the rights of their readers. And they say that this is protected information. Who took this book out is something they will not reveal. And there are librarians who say, we will go to jail before we will re reveal this information of who read this. And so that's a world in which something is published, but the audience is invisible. And not only is it invisible, but it's this inalienable right, this important civil right that that audience remain visible. But if you think about publication in the context of a conversation, it's one of the drawbacks of the online world, is that you speak, but you don't see your audience. So right now, I have a fairly good idea of who's listening to me. Usually when you talk to, in face to face, you know who else is there. You gauge your words. You determine how intimately you want to speak. You know, do you want to reveal secrets? How much do you want to reveal of yourself? And when you can't see the audience, as you often can't online, you're likely to make all kinds of errors about privacy, et cetera. And so online, when the metaphor we're using is conversation, the invisibility of that audience is a problem. 
And we have, for instance, you know, going back well before the web, the days of Usenet, pejorative words like lurkers to mean the people that you don't see. So simply the framing of, is this a publication, a book, and are we in something like a library, or is this thing that I wrote a piece of a conversation, completely changes the ethical questions about whether you want to be able to see your audience or not. And so as background, um, one of the things I, the framing of my book is I have three sort of basic things that I think are good fundamental guidelines for designing pieces. I'll just go through those quickly. One is be legible. Part of the problem of an entirely abstract world or a world that tends to be very text-based is it's not legible. On the social side, when it's illegible, you can't see the people, you don't know what's going on. So one of the things you want to do as a designer is bring legibility to it. This is uh, some of the most interesting stuff you can read on the web. I have kids, and one of the arguments um, a lot of parents who are interested in technology have with schools is to say Wikipedia is great. Because like my kid's school says, you're not allowed to use Wikipedia. You may not look at it. It's not a good source. And say, this is great. And the thing that's most interesting about Wikipedia is not only is the information good, but you have the whole history of how this these stories and these articles are written and what are the arguments that went into it so you can teach these kids not just to read the article as a finished product but you should be looking at this material and seeing the background but when you look at this you think this is not very interesting this is like you know this is you know this is the record of who said something and who contributed it where so um, a student of mine Fernanda Viegas and um, Martin Wattenberg when Martin was back at IBM did this piece called History Flow. And what they did was they mapped how edits were made in Wikipedia articles. And so this is, I, I think this is either coffee or chocolate, which turned out to be um, surprisingly controversial. But what's interesting here, too, is so here they sort of map in. What you can see here is you could see an edit war. And you know, <laughs> someone wrote something, someone reverted it, someone wrote something, and someone reverted it. What's also very interesting is they did two versions of it. There's this version, and then this version is the same material, but it's much smoother. And the difference in what they're showing here is on this version, they um, visualized, you know, with these bars show every time an edit is made. So over here, there's not too much editing, but here, every time someone did something, you see the effect of it. So what you're seeing here, what they've made legible, is the act of writing. What this version shows is the act of reading, because here they're showing where the edits are, but they colored in by time slice. And so what happens is those reversions are very, very, very fast. Um, and so instead of just looking at it and saying, wow, this is just being argued over and it's going back and forth, it's always changing, what you're seeing here is the fact that for almost every reader except the one who happens to come up maybe at a bad point before something was reverted, they're never going to see any of it. So there's a couple of little changes, but it's mainly smooth. So the notion of legibility is both that a graphic like this can make the information more legible, but there may be multiple versions of it. That it's that once you make things clearer, there's lots of different stories to tell. You may the most important thing might be to tell both of them. Um, so while you may say that my work is fundamental to you, your work is very <laughs> fundamental to me. So one of the really inspiring ideas behind my writing and my work with my students was this notion um, from Jim's work with Scott, Scott Stornetto was you know, to say, go beyond being there. That if you're going to make an interfaces for people to communicate with each other, if you're going to make, or if you're going to make anything, don't just replicate a second or third rate version of what you can do face to face. Do something better. And so, um, for instance, video conferencing is you know, mostly a horrible experience. It's like you're almost there, but you're not quite there. Um, there's a one of the chapters in my book goes into a whole sort of, it's my attempt at a proof of why it's never going, you can make it sharper and better, and it's never going to be right because, among other things, you, you just can never have the common ground. So you don't have, you could do a little bit of, you know, getting the eye contact right, but the key things about what makes a shared space shared, you will not have. But, so you say, okay, well, I want to have a conference with someone. How do I do it? And when you, uh, the important thing is to also recognize that often, the ways that you can go beyond being there 
aren't to have more and get further beyond and have it be fancier and you know it's going to be a four-dimensional conference instead of a three-dimensional conference mm -hmm. is sometimes you want to make it much simpler yes so I, I mean i think you're right that nearly all of the interesting opportunities for sticking a computer in the communication channel are to mm -hmm. do different things in right. the real world um, i do think that there's a lot of grandparents who would defend the mm -hmm. merits of video conferencing yes I mean, and among others yeah and actually I, I do. When I write, write about it, I do say that it, when you're, what you're, if you're, what you're trying to do is see a particular individual closer. So if your spouse is in the army or your grandparent, if what you really want is just like that face, then it's it's good. But in general, a lot of the other things we're trying to do, it's not as good. And in, and even when you, when we talk about it with grand, as being grandparents. Um, there, a lot of times you think of it with a little kid where they're not really going to communicate, but you, there may be other ways that even once you had older kids, you have you know, th two kids at home and you want to chat with them while they're doing their homework, it might not be the right interface. So, but yes, that, you know, that when you just miss that person, you want to be as close to them, it does. Or I did travel planning with one of my best friends and I video, I'd never video conference mm -hmm. socially, but I did, on, I do often for work. But I did on uh, on Saturday because I wanted to get a sense of like, was he on board with the plan, mm -hmm. which is much easier even with a crummy video link than it is just over a telephone. Right, and one of the issues too is that a lot of the problems. So the common ground problem with video is that if I'm talking to Scott here, you see me speaking to him. But if we were in a conference, you would just see me looking somewhere else. You would just know that I'm not looking at you. And to recreate that sense of common ground where you see who's looking at whom, because a lot of times the information that's interesting isn't just is that person looking at you, but where is their attention drawn and why is it drawn off? And so there's pieces you can do with two people, but it starts to rapidly fall off with three or four or five. So that's, you know, that's the issue. But anyway, Look, we can argue about that a bit. But anyway, so but this is an example of how you might think about conferencing in a different way. For those of you who are wondering why we have these circles here and what that had to do with conferencing, it's, um, I couldn't get a good screenshot of an old piece called Talking in Circles, but this is effectively how it worked, was to deal with the audio conference side. Because with audio conferencing, one of the problems is once you have more people, it's very hard to know who's speaking. And we had done a series of pieces called chat circles where um, we were interested in saying, instead of having avatars with faces, what's the simplest thing we can do and then build up from there? And so the idea is each of the circles is one person. And for the speaking, ver the sonic audio version, the idea is when you're closer, you can actually hear the person. In chat circles, you had to be close to them in order to see their words. And people went away, further away, you could see them and hear. Um, it was a simple interface to audio conference where when you're near people, you could um, hear what they were saying. To a certain point, it starts to fall off, and then you would start seeing them very fuzzy, and you'd know they were there. And you could see who was speaking. These center pieces would um, vibrate with the voice. So you could see who was speaking. So for one, you'd immediately be able to recognize who the different speakers are. But one of the nice pieces is you could have an audio conference where you'd know who was speaking, but you could have side conversations by moving away. So if you have like seven people, and then one person starts talking to another, they can kind of drift off for a bit, have their side conversation, then come right back. So it's very, very simple, but it solves a lot of the things that you're trying to do with a much fancier conferencing system by being doing something very um, small. And then you could start adding other pieces in. So this was a version where um, you could say, OK, these these particular spaces are not recorded, and these spaces are recorded. So you could start saying, what are the functions that you want to have that you want to express without trying to get the detail of the sort of rep represent representing the full spatial effect, but just to say, what are the important features and build those in from the ground up? And then the third piece, and the most complicated one, the one we'll sort of focus on today, is that you want it to be beneficial. And that seems like a very obvious thing. But it's actually really hard with developing interfaces to always know what their effect is, and then also what is beneficial to a particular audience. And so one of the 
things to know on, you know, on the net is that sometimes what people want is cooperation. But there are other f interfaces and there are other spaces. For instance, um, how many of you have heard of 4chan? Or how many, have, is there anyone who hasn't? So, so 4chan is sort of called the cesspool of the internet. And, but its users love it. And it's very creative. And there's a lot of things in that particular interface that give you the type of behavior you get there. Um, the way that, it, you know, that 4chan works is that you have a lot of, you have everyone is anonymous who comes in and things disappear very, very quickly off the front page. So if you want what you said to last, it has to be something that people will want to repeat. So it has to be very, um, you know, sometimes people use the word sticky for it, but it has to be something that people are going to try and bump up and repeat over and over. Because if it's not something the audience loves, it disappears. And so that's part of one of the reasons why so many memes have come out of there is that it's kind of a filter for things that are very, very repeatable. And because it's anonymous, it can be really obnoxious things that are very repeatable. But that particular design is perfectly designed to get the type of behavior you get there, which they want. So when I say beneficial, it, is, it can encompass the broad range of things given what that community wants. Um, but here are just a couple of examples of things that were particularly designed to shape conversation. Um, this is work that Kara Halios, who was a PhD student of mine, did. She's now a professor at UIUC, and she did this with one of her students. But it's a conversation, um, she calls it a conversation clock, and it's a table where there's microphones at each seat, and it keeps track of who is speaking at all times. And it builds up this sort of clock to show the conversation. So it doesn't say who should be speaking more. I think, Vinny, we were talking about this a little earlier. You know, it doesn't say you, you should be speaking more, you should be speaking less. It doesn't say you shouldn't be interrupting, but it shows who is doing that. And so part of the idea here is to say, this is something that should help a group shape its social mores simply by being a mirror. Now, you could make it so that, okay, if you interrupt, it shows it like as a big red splotch. Mm -hmm. That would be a somewhat more heavy-handed way. Maybe in some circumstances you need that. Um, Joni D'Amico did studies doing similar work at IBM where she, did, where she did highlight interruptions because she found, for instance, that women were interrupted so much more than men that she wanted to highlight, you know, this is, these people are continuously interrupting. But here it's simply a mirror showing how much different people talk at different times. And in fact, you don't always want a balance. So part of it is if you're building something like this, it's generic. Sometimes you want to invite everyone to participate. You, other times you might want to highlight, you know, is this person never speaking? Are they too shy? Do they feel left out? Or are they not speaking because they're an intern in a group and they feel like it's not their place yet to contribute? So a lot of it is a mirror like this lets people see what's happening better, but they have to develop their own mores versus a system that is more specific about doing it. Um, this is the, you know, the prototypical um, panopticon. You know, this is actually taken from um, the um, Illinois State Penitentiary, which was one of the prisons that was built with the panopticon model. And the idea behind this was, if people feel like they're under surveillance, they will act that way. Even if they're not always under surveillance, they will always act as if they are if it's continuously in doubt. And so mm -hmm. one of the pieces we started talking initially about audience, but one of the things also to keep in mind is that when you don't know the audience, the audience exists in people's mind. And so you need to understand that there's always that sense of how big or how small it is. And that if you, the part of the appeal of the internet and a lot of what has worked so far with a lot of the online conversations is that people live in ignorance of the scale of their audience. That if people were always aware that their words are going to last, you know, in the indefinite future, and that there may actually be 10,000 people reading them. They might not be asking the kind of interesting, intimate things that they do ask now. And so it's sort of this consensual, often ignoring of the scale of the audience that lets the conversations work as they can. So one of the things we need to balance as designers is how much knowledge do you want to give people? At what point do you say, well, it's really important from a privacy perspective that people know 
that they have this audience. But what you may do with that is completely shut down the conversation. And so you have to be aware if that's the effect that you want. Um, I think it can make, there may be times when we should do things that might seem very privacy affecting. For instance, um, there's another example in the book that I don't show here where a, um, someone did a visualization for an office of who was emailing who at all times. And that seems like, <coughs> wow, that's quite the privacy violation. But if you think about it, if you're working in an office where, while well, we always think of our email as private, where all of your email is actually fairly public, that it's one of those things you sign when you take that job, that you know your email is property of the company, your boss is really looking at it, having like a big visualization on the wall that's showing emails going back and forth and going out might be just the reminder that everybody needs to <laughs> think, OK, whatever I'm doing here needs to be fo work focused. It ha I, it's going to be read. I should not be doing any of my personal email here that I, yes, my email is public. So, some, so a lot of it is we need to re give people the sense, the right sense of public and private, both, and which sometimes is a reflection of reality, but sometimes in sort of the case of the Pamnopticon, it may not be exactly what we want. Now, for thinking of identity as a frame, I'm going to run through a couple of examples, one having to do with gender and one having to do with um, artificial intelligence. So one of the things that's been a big part of the history of the internet are questions around the representation of race and gender. And sort of the obvious thing is that as soon as you walk into a room, as soon as you meet someone, the first things you get to know about them are you see their race, you see their gender, you see their age. And you're, you're immediately aware of it and you start to categorize people by these um, different metrics. And it shapes what you think of their words. And so for, especially in the, um, the early days of the uh, sort of proto or pre-internet, in the days of Usenet, identity wasn't as big an issue because people came in to conversations with an institutional identity. You know, they came in f from their university or a research center. They, it was with their name that was from a very official account. It wasn't until the early 80s that people started being online with private accounts from consumer interfaces and also that a lot of um, systems were started like MUDs where people could start playing around with different identity games. And this is um, a quote from Howard Rheingold who was um, fascinated by MUDs in the early days. And, he was writing, Sherry Turkle was writing, a lot of people were writing about this amazing world in which identity was very fluid. You could be whoever you wanted to be. And, you know, and to some extent, like, yes, if you say, I'm a talking frog, nobody's going to believe you. But on the other hand, if you said, if you're a woman and you said you were a man, if you're a man and you said you were a woman, people were likely to, agree, you know, to believe you at first because th there wasn't just much evidence otherwise and there was less recognition that you know, cheap signals like that are really cheap, that in fact you could go into like a lot of very sexy chat rooms and they were always full of like beautiful buxom women who were like 36, 22, 36 with like long blonde hair and they were all 40 year old men. But, you know, eventually people realized that. But, um, but there was still this fascination that, of whether we could create truly a post-gender world. And a lot of this is not, so some of it comes from the technology and some of it comes from what's going on in the world at large. You know, this is also soon after Judith Butler wrote a book, Gender Trouble, where she's claiming that, you know, gender truly is performance that it's, there isn't really an inherent state of gender, but all of these things are performative. And so it's a very radical difference from how people were thinking, you know, certainly 70 years earlier, where there was a sense that these are very, very ingrained essential, essential pieces. And she's saying that essentialism is a myth. Um, so there's a whole philosophy in the air at the same time that these pieces are, are all performance. And so that when you live in a world where words are sort of everything about, are the foundation of the society instead of the body, it's going to be this entirely radical new experience where these are just blanks. And so, but what's, what's very, been, was very interesting is this happened to some extent. You could see, you know, there's certainly times where there are conversations where it's hard to, you know, know who people are and 
people may forget about it. There's some level of passing, but there's also some interesting work, for instance, that Susan Herring did. Um, she's a linguist, and she looked at the gender differences in computer-mediated communication, and she found that there were very, very recognizable differences which seems obviously now in the way men and women use language and that men posted longer messages. Basically, they tended to be more assertive, more aggressive, they um, recruiter. Women tend to be much more apologetic. There's an entire way in which you learn to use language. And so the fact that you come online and you say that you were a woman, but you were actually a man or vice versa, it didn't erase how you use language. But what it would then do is lead people to greatly misjudge your character. Because what happens is that if I may come off as a, you know, I'm an academic, so I may come off in a general population as a very assertive woman, but I still don't necessarily come off that way as a man. So if I go online and I say that I'm a man, I may come off as a very self-effacing man who tends to be a little apologetic and apologize because the voice that I have grown up using is still much more, you know, trying to find consensus and, you know, I am much more likely to sign off and say thanks as just a generic way of, you know, a generic signature or to say I'm sorry when it doesn't mean I'm apologizing but it means that's an unfortunate thing that happened. That's much less likely to be used by men. If someone, if someone writes like that and other people think they're a man, they are going to come, you're going to get a very strong sense of, you know, of a very passive man and vice versa. So the erasure of gender was far more complicated than it seemed at the time, yeah? So in, in this Herring work, was this looking, are these categories people who are, presenting online the same gender that they present in everyday She looked life? both. She looked at both. So she looked both at people who, how men talked in general and how women talked in general on forums. But she's also looked at, um, she did work with um, Amy Bruckman at Georgia Tech looking a lot at people who are presenting, saying that they were men and presenting as women. And that there, it was a, a, even a different issue because they would, um, they tended to stereotype so ridiculously that like when men said, I'm going to act as a woman, it was like it, they were much more like the drag queen version of women and vice versa. So Herring's work though, I think is in, w when she was looking at this, it was in some ways more insidious because it's not necessarily if I'm trying to be a man, but if I'm just trying to be generic. And so I just come, if I say, if I'm in a forum where it's just, you're not supposed to be thinking about gender at all, that it's still very highlighted because we also tend to, for, especially for women, because people in the absence of gender will assign a norm. So unless it's a forum on a women's topic, if someone comes on and they're not recognizable as a woman, they're going to, people are going to assume they're a man. But then they're still speaking as a woman and then they will be misperceived as a very self-effacing man. So. It's, um, it's very complicated because then it comes off as an argument that maybe you should always say what your gender is unless you're very sure of how you're using language. So it's, it's very complicated. Um, but then there's interesting work also in this vein. This is, well, look, gen gender is not the only issue where we have these complexities of framing. There's issues around race. And there's similar studies about like, you know, certainly you can look, you know, there's a number of studies that show that if people think that something is written by a black writer instead of a white writer, they will just evaluate it much more poorly. So there's advantages to saying you're, um, you know, to hiding race from what you're writing. And there's, but this work takes it in a slightly different direction. This is by um, Kurzban Tubi and Cosmides. And they were looking at coalitions and race. And what their basic conclusion is that age and gender are fairly deeply rooted in our cultural perceptions of people. That if you, um, so, so that that may be something that's somewhat very, very difficult to escape in an online space. But, um, but that race is just part of a general cultural construct around in groups and out groups and groupings. And that what they found was that, well, people always categorize others as gender, that they could do studies where if you had students come together 
they tended to separate and think of themselves differently as in-group and out-group by race when they knew nothing about each other. But they could make a game and make up sort of races and in-groups and very quickly it would erase the cultural, the existing cultural concepts of race and have their sort of artificial in-groups and out-groups be much more salient in how the students perceived each other. And one of the places you see this in a very vivid way online is games, where the gaming worlds have recreated <coughs> imaginary races that you know, work very well as these in and out groups. To, the extent, how, to what extent um, they function as roles, I think, is still to be discovered. But when you look at something like Stack Overflow, you start to see the world in which you, know, you have this type of profile becoming the ways people see each other is through the set of salient characteristics in that space. And so I think one of the important pieces here, and these are not, um, I don't think these particular style of interfaces are the be, and, be all and end all of online profiles, but I think the important piece from the Kurzweil, um, Kurzweil work is that not so much about that you want to create other oppositional coalitions, but that it's, you can't try and create a complete absence of persona. If you're trying to get people to perceive others based on their words, as human beings, we're, we very much want to categorize people in different ways. And so what you need to do is give them, is to shape the sort of society you want by saying what are the roles you want people to hang their metrics on. And so you can't just say let's erase these different categories, you have to give other people a positive set of categories and say, this is what's going to be salient. You look puzzled. Well, the categories in different cultures vary so widely yes. that I'm skeptical that there are, I mean, for that reason, it seems unlikely that there are uh, categories that need to be present. They vary widely, but they're, they are, I think, but it, okay, maybe I'm, let me, try and explain this better. It's when you meet people or when you are dealing, you say you're part of a big, a big group of people, you're going to start categorizing people in different ways. And absent any other model, you will bring the existing categorizations from your everyday life in. And it is possible that some of those are so deep-seated, such as gender, that it will take a tremendous amount of work to erase them. But a lot of the other categorizations Exactly, they, are, they differ across cultures, are much more malleable. But you can't just say, okay, we're not going to bring in cues about those because people will search for cues. And your mind to, to sort of tries to do this when you see people, you don't just deal with ciphers. It, um, as a matter of, there's other studies, um, I can't remember the name offhand of someone who did this, but, but who said that it looks like when you, online, when you have the absence of categories, instead of not categorizing people through existing stereotypes, they tended to stereotype people more because when you don't have the cues about what makes this individual different than the stereotype, all you have is the stereotype. So once you get any sense that, oh, this person might be Asian or this person might be older, you just you, you just have the stereotype of typical piece. So the argument that I'm making here is that one of the ways we get away from that is that you need to provide lots of cues about the person, but if you say, okay, we want people to be categorized through their words and their contributions here, then you have to sort of help build interfaces where, okay, the group of people who argue in this way, or the group of people who've been writing about these things, and the group of people who've taken these roles in our community, these are the things, and we'll, we sort of build up their representation to group them according to the sets of groups and categories that we want to have in our artificial society of our online world. I like uh, Bruno Latour talks about it as a well-articulated theory or kind of, instead yes. of saying one or two, it is this yeah, or not. Yeah. If you have more it's statements station. than propositions, then you have a well-articulated Yeah, you have one, the more detail and it's yeah. more to fit in with. So I'm going to take a sort of quick tour through a couple of interfaces that we did that looked at, um, they're really just sketches because you know the ultimate way of dealing with how you make how do you make a profile of someone a portrait of someone out of data 
is still a huge open question. So these are just really sketches to look at to think about some different directions. Um, this is some work by Alex Dragulescu, who maybe some of you know because he was, he, before he was a student of mine, he was a student here at um, UCSD. Um, he did spam plants. He did beautiful visualizations playing around with the notion of beauty that came out of the ugliness of spam and viruses. But um, this, these are visualizations that are based on Twitter. And what he, we did, he did here was one side of the profile was um, the words that people used with uncharacteristic frequency across everything they talked about. So what are the words that typified them? And the other side were what were the words that typified what they were talking about today? And so what you would have is when it, you'd see it as a running thing, so it's just a screenshot, is that this, this would change slowly, but this side would change sort of as they were interacting and sort of someone who wasn't present that day would sort of the words would fade away over time. So if you didn't, we weren't able to see anything there, it meant they just weren't really active that day. So you'd have this record both of activity, but just also of the words that people were saying. And some of this came out of a couple of different st studies I did. And actually, one of my favorite design exercises for incoming students, too, was to say, can you just, I'm not going to tell you anything about how to do this. I want you to make two visualizations. I want you to visualize an online conversation. I want you to visualize a conversation among a group of people, you know, in your lab or at dinner or whatever. And invariably, they would come in. The visualization of conversations online is a linear piece. It's a stream. It's, you know, it's just like your, you know, it's like a feed. And then the visualization of the people that they talked about, talked with at dinner or something, was always individual people and what the individuals had to say. And it's something we see very little of online, particularly in something like Twitter. You see this whole stream, but you lose sense of who the individuals are. And so when you break it out and you see this, you start to realize it is this conversation among all these different people and how you see them and what their words are. So for me, this is like this window I would like to have onto that, you know, and have it just as a wall where it's just sort of like the tide. You sort of watch it come and go, but it gives you that sense of who the individuals are. And um, just a little bit, when I, when I said that the um, were, were words that they, they use with uncharacteristic frequency, it's a simple technique, but it also deals with this um, sort of concept of framing, is that it's, um, and we use this a lot with our, anything we did with text, is to make, um, a caricature of it. So the way caricatures work is this was actually this is was done in the at MIT I think in the very very late 70s or, or in the late 70s. So it's one of also the first computer computer generated caricatures. But if this face is the norm, I believe it was actually President Reagan. But um, and then this is um, so okay. So this is no, I'm trying to remember exactly how this one worked. Okay. So this is the this is his face, how it actually is. This is an average face. And then this is the caricature. And the caricature is made by looking at the, all the places where this face differs from the norm, and then exaggerating it, and you get this piece. Um, one of the pieces I, um, that's also very interesting to look at, though, um, I didn't put into the book because I came across it a little bit late, late to do this. But they were, if you look at um, newspaper caricatures of President Obama, who's biracial, and you look in a um, black, in black press versus mainstream white press, the racial features are very, very different, in particular when he's been criticized. Because one will show him the face ends up being much more white looking than he looks in person, and then the other will show him looking much more black than he looks in person. And I think it's a very unconscious bias of the caricature maker because they're working from a different norm. And so when you exaggerate him outside that norm, you get a, a, a caricatures of two different races. But so it's a very, very fascinating thing where it's a really this interesting notion of how you get our, how you make something recognizable, but it's also about what is the norm that you start from to do it. And so when you play around with doing these sorts of pieces with words, a lot of the questions are what are the norms that you are using to say this is uncharacteristic or this is different or this is a particularly outstanding use of the language. Um, so this is another piece that uses that type of um, language norming. And this is against its own um, 
uh, of people's own corpus of work of mail. So this is a visualization of email. So it, it makes a dual portrait of two people and what are the things they've talked about over time. And the reason I think it's an interesting framing issue is that it's, so it shows like here are all the things you've talked about over a period of years. And the, the, so you can look at it and see how the different words that you've used have changed over time, how much you've talked to each other. The words in the back are the things that were really salient in that time. And in the smaller periods of time, what are the words you looked at? But um, it was also an interesting one about that sort of space of what's private and what's public because we designed this to be a mirror for people. The question we were looking at when we made it was people tend to save huge amounts of mail. A lot of people save all, all of their mail, and some of it's laziness, but, um, and most of the, but some of it is like people often don't want to throw it away, and they say, no, I want to keep this. And when you look at most mail programs that deal with that archive, they're about helping you find a specific piece of mail when there's an important piece of information. But you know that email that said, oh, let's have lunch at 1.15 instead of 1. I'm trying to finish something up. It's not very important, but people still save those. And so our hypothesis was that they save them because that this collection of mail was about the development of a relationship. And that all those little pieces were about the relationship and its existence. And so it was the pattern as a whole of how much did you talk? And like how many of those conversations were lunch, lunch, lunch? Like there might be some people, you would look at your mail and all it would say is lunch, you know? <laughs> um, and that's what you, you know, it might be your best friend because important things you talk about over that lunch. Um, but so it, it was a way of looking at that, but we looked at it as one word because it would, we thought that would be enough to trigger people's memories. But it had the f interesting characteristic that when we had people use this, we noticed that a lot of people were cutting these out, were like printing them out and putting them on their cubicles. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. Why are you doing this? And they said, well, it's like it's a photograph. It's of a relationship that you can't normally photograph because people like to have pictures of their friends on, this, on their walls, but you can't photograph a virtual friendship. But by using the words, and then we saw that by having just the single words, if we'd had longer phrases, it would have been too revealing what you were talking about. Like, I can put this up happily. This is actually my mail with my, what started as my husband and by the end is my ex-husband. <laughs> but I can, you know, I can, we had this in a museum where you could actually read the words and it still didn't reveal anything. Like, if you looked really closely, you would see, see that it was certainly a change. And if you knew the story, you could say, oh, I, I get it. But just, just reading the words itself didn't reveal it. So you would need to have the, so it's a very interesting sort of framing about privacy because if someone isn't privy to the story, there's no privacy violation. They, if they know it, they read more into it. The more they know of the story, the more sense they can make out of those words. Someone who knows me well could see like, oh my God, I know what that is. But no one who, someone who doesn't know me well, it's fine, it's just a word. So it's another thing also where it's, there's an interesting framing of what's public and what's private. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that. But, um, and then this one is just a, an interesting sort of cautionary tale about the idea of the machine as, as portrait artist because um, this was done as part of a museum exhibit that's actually from the cover of my book and that was about, um, it was about identity living in a world where there's sort of overwhelming amounts of information. And we did as part of it um, a piece that people loved. You type your name in and it would go chug, 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 chug and you could watch it sort of thinking it was gathering information. It was doing a, a big search on your name and trying to figure out everything about you and then it would do a machine language analysis of who you were and what your roles in society were. And it would sort of come up and say, oh, this are all the significant things in your life about who you are. Um, but what, what it was also meant to be was, you know, it was an art piece. People loved it. They were like, this is great. It's telling me all these things. But it was meant to be this cautionary tip. So what if your name is John Smith? Will it be a portrait of you and every other John Smith who's ever had anything written about them or by them online? And then for a lot of other things, it just mischaracterized words. It, did, does, it didn't have, it was the most sophisticated sort of machine 
learning algorithms of the time, but they're still not very good at understanding ambiguity, irony, synonyms um, in, in many cases. Um, and so it would make these other characterizations. And so while people like the sense of it, we could see them trying to twist themselves into understanding why why is it characterizing me this way? So it was almost ended up being a little bit like the Zodiac, where you know you read something and then suddenly it's very meaningful to you, even though maybe it's sort of nonsense, but it would be very meaningful to you, especially once at the bottom you would recognize you know particular pieces that really were truly about you. Um, so now we're going to sort of talk about a you know for the last part of the talk about a, a different set of framing issues um, around questions about our relationship to the not quite human other. And I want to start with um, the Tamagotchi because that, it's also an interesting framing story that I find kind of fascinating is how, um, is if you look at a Tamagotchi, is there anyone who doesn't know what a Tamagotchi is to start with? So okay, so Tamagotchis were a very, very popular toy about 15 years ago where you would have this pet. So they were framed as a pet. And you, you would get the Tamagotchi and it would be hungry. So you had to press one of its buttons to feed it. And then it would, like, then it would soil its little area here. And then you had to press little buttons to keep it clean. And it would do this at sort of random times. And um, it took a lot of care, and it took a lot. And it, with 24 hours, you might have to care for it. You have to, might have to wake up in the middle of the night to take care of it. And if you took care of it, it would grow up and it would thrive. It would be really rewarding. But if you didn't take care of it, if you missed some of those feedings or you left it in its own mess, it would like it wouldn't thrive. And it was inter interesting. Different market is that in Japan, it actually died. And there you were. Your Tamagotchi was dead. There was nothing you could do about it. In America. <laughs> Um, they sort of like, they got really sick, and I think if they died, you could revive them, but it, they weren't, that didn't go over well here, the like really dead Tamagotchi. But, but the interesting framing question, and particularly from the ethical standpoint, is so you're at dinner, you're at your grandmother's house for dinner, and you know, you have this Tamagotchi, and you have to go and feed it. Now, if you look at it as a toy, that's really rude. You know, you have left this dinner, you've left this important thing to go, you're sitting here paying attention to your toy. But if you frame it as it's a proto-pet, you know, if you, you know, this kid is learning what it means to care about something and one day they'll actually have responsibility for an actual hamster or a cat and then one day an actual baby, um, you know, then it's sort of wrong to say, okay, you shouldn't be taking care of it because we're, this whole thing has been built to elicit all of your nurturing instinct. And what are we trying to do? Tell people to like tamp down that nurturing instinct and not deal with it. So, so there's, it's a puzzle. You know, I could, as a parent, I could see why it's rude, but I can also see why you don't want to take something, have it bring out nurturance, and then tell you, no, don't nurture things. It seems like it's a bad way of teaching. So as a framing, they're, they're very complicated issues. Um, and one of the things that sort of ties these pieces together is that sort of the grandfather of this whole problem comes from Alan Turing's work, his 1950 paper on um, computing machinery and intelligence. And one of the interesting, so also is there anyone who's not familiar with this paper? So, okay, so the background here is um, that Alan Turing was sort of the father of computing. But he wrote a paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, and he was interested in whether can computers be intelligent. And it's, it's a paper that's fascinated me for decades, and it's a very puzzling one, because he wrote, he started it by talking about what he called um, the imitation game. And I guess it was a British parlor game. And the idea was you have two people behind a wall, and they're corresponding just by text. You can't hear the voice. And they're going to claim to be, or there's one, one person behind a wall, but like a couple of people disappeared, but one person is acting. And that person is going to say that they're a woman. But of the people who've left, you know, it's a woman and a man, you have to figure out if that person is lying, the one who's actually doing the correspondence. Are they really a man or are they, you know, are they really a woman or are they actually a man? You can ask them anything you want. Because he says, okay, that's the imitation game, you all understand this. Now we can go and do this with computers and humans. You're corresponding with something. It's going to correspond with you on paper. You know, this is still 1950, but you know, it could be a piece of paper. 
You can ask it anything, and then by its answers, you have to decide, is it a human or a computer? One of the, and his conclusion was that he believed that 50 years hence, which is now sometime in the past, that computers would be able to play this game so well that they would win. And, but not only that, but that the interesting piece isn't so much whether computers can win the game, but what the significance is that for how we should treat computers, which is that once the computer can win this game, you know, if we can't tell that it is not human, we need to think of it, not necessarily from a uh, ethical side, but just that we would do this. And we would just take for granted that it was human and that, that, was, that it was as human-like <laughs> as anything and that was fine and there was no problem with it. Um, one objection I haven't really seen, which has always puzzled me, is that clearly in the gender version of the game, if a man has convinced you he is a woman, it still does not make him a woman. It makes him good at imitating a woman. It doesn't make him a woman. But people seem to make that mistake a lot with um, AI, that the difference between the acting of intelligence and the being of intelligence makes a vast difference. And one of them, um, a very interesting piece that was done very, very early on in reaction to Turing was done by a man named Joseph Weizenbaum, who did a, um, a piece called Eliza. This is my conversation with the, well, there's versions of Eliza that are online today. But he, um, he did something where it was, he said, it's just a semantic parser. You can write anything to this parser and it will respond to you. Now, and it worked very well, but the only reason it worked was the way that it was framed. Because he did a couple of versions and then they weren't very successful. And then he went and he did a version that he called Doctor. And he framed it as a Rogerian psychologist. And it's a form of psychology where you're just supposed to repeat the patient's statements back to them. And so it's a particular type of dialogue that once you believe you are speaking to someone who is playing that role, it becomes very believable. You really believe it's a person because if you didn't have that role and you hadn't put that co cognitive category on them, it wouldn't make any sense that they were saying those things. But once you put it in that framing, it makes perfectly good sense and you ascribe an enormous amount of intelligence and empathy and reason behind it. Um, and so he had a very interesting sort of career tra trajectory after this because he thought he was going to do this and then by saying to people, oh, well, all it did was like, you know, this is a 1964 computer could do this. You could just take your words and spit them back to you with a, diff with a couple of simple grammatical rules. Everyone would say, oh, that's right, Turing's paper is ridiculous. Language is a terrible proxy for understanding the existence of mind. Instead, what everyone said is, can you please get out of the room? I'm having a private conversation with your computer. He was so horrified by this. He was a, um, he was a refugee from Nazi Germany, and he thought this was a sign that we were just ready to give over civilizations to the machine. He wrote a book called Computer Power and Human Reason that when I first got into computing, my professor who was, gave to me to read. And, um, what it basically said was, we really, really re need to watch out because the people who are going into computer science are not the people we want to have shaping our world <laughs> in any <laughs> way whatsoever, which is, you know, it's a very interesting critique. And so I don't think he really, I think he spent the rest of his career as a cr critic of technology um, and not as, you know, th the sort of computer developer that he had initially thought to be. And so, there's a, just a couple of questions I want to leave you with here about these framings of what does it mean to have computers that are increasing, that increasingly we cannot tell by the behaviors they exhibit what they do. So you may wonder why this piece of grass is here. So this is actually a picture of AstroTurf. So at one end, what we're seeing now are a huge number of software agents um, who, for instance, this is, you know, it's a term on Twitter because you're supposed to have grassroots politics and things like, you know, Twitter are supposed to give you a sense of what is the grassroots and what are the grassroots talking about. And so they use the term astroturfing where you have artificial agents pretending to be that grassroots behind a political movement. So you can make all kinds of agents that on the one hand are able to imitate being a human in a social situation increasingly well 
but for completely devious means of looking like they are a set of agents. So what are the ways that we are going, we have to sort of develop in a race to stay beyond this type, this use of things that make, that let us um, imitate humans really easily. Twitter is rife with this in part because the 140 character limit that makes normally verse people so charmingly succinct also makes it very easy because you don't have a lot of cues and so it's very easy to imitate a human. Then on the other side, this is sort of the heartwarming side of this is Paro, who is a $6,000 interactive seal that is meant, it's not meant to imitate a human, but it's designed to imitate a um, sentient pet. So it's not just like a stuffed animal, but it will sort of, it will make noises and it will react and it's very, very responsive. And the company that makes it is a Japanese company and in Japan, this huge aging population, they have very, very few caregivers. And so it's being marketed in a, and you know, there's a huge amount of attention with it about saying that this is something that will help us care for elderly people. And so this is a picture that was taken in a New Jersey nursing home. And the woman in the background is the daughter of the woman in the foreground. And according to the article, the woman in the foreground has Alzheimer's and is often very unresponsive. But you put this responsive seal in her lap and not only does she sort of warm to it, but a lot of her language tends to come back when she's had it. So here, it doesn't look like, okay, so she may be deceived into thinking it's responding to her, but is that ethically wrong? Because it says it calms her and she's actually able to communicate with other people. So here you're faking sentience, because she says, look, you know, that's something that responds to her, that here is a faking of sentience for a very good purpose. Um, but if you start saying, okay, well, we're going to do this because I, you know, this is great. I used to have to give my iPad to my kid to shut him up, but now I can give him the seal to keep the baby quiet. You know, there is the faking sentience, you know, and what, at what level, what use of this faking of sentience, even say in a pet? So when is it, because you're trying to shut the child up, when is it this fake nur nurturance? Is there something creepy about being taught to nurture something that unlike an actual pet isn't actually benefiting from it. And when is it something that's truly beneficial? All of these pieces are the types of big questions that framing is important to understand in how to think about the, what does it mean to make a beneficial interface? Thank you. Okay. Any questions? A lot of people ask us a similar kind of question um, about Ruby. Um, and there's also a robot rat in mm -hmm. uh, another lab, and the Chiba, uh, who has a uh, robot rat interacting with real rats. And uh, part of what I'm thinking through is we're really interested in the social dynamics that uh, allow learning to happen. Mm -hmm. And at very young, early childhood, also increasingly throughout the life, right. uh, learning is, is socially mediated. Right. So if we, we have, I have no doubt that the kids know it's not a real, it's not a human, uh, and the rats know it's not, it's not right. a real rat. Yet the, the timing and coordination allows them to interact in a way that they can learn something. Right. Um, and what you see also in the, in the very early childhood, that they are, they are they're self uh, um, pacing and learning, and we don't uh, force kids to interact. So they're actually learning to learn from technology in a way that is almost, you know, it's more mediated by how they do social interactions with humans. Mm -hmm. And as soon as there's a human in the room, they're always more focused on humans. But there's something about maybe finding the ways to allow uh, the natural sense to, to really find out what's what's good about the technology. And part of it is gonna be that the people are going to discover, so the Alzheimer's patient, Mm -hmm. He's probably going to discover how to use the seal, the benefit, more than you know us kind of trying to worry as designers about it. Right? Then the trick becomes how to how to choose ecologically valid settings in which to, to do this research. Right. Um, I don't know if you have any. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, th I think part of it also is to, is to figure out what is the framing in our culture as a whole for it, because, for instance, you can, um, people have gotten very, very, very upset about the death of fictional characters. So we get very emotionally invested in that. At some level, if there, had been, if there wasn't any fiction, if fiction didn't exist, and then I told you about fiction, and I said, well, I'm going to make up this story, and it's not real, and none of these people are very real, and people are going to read it, and they're going to burst into tears, and they're going like, to write to the author and say, why can't you bring this character back? People say, that's immoral. You know, if you just heard about it, you would think it was really bad to do that. You're manipulating people's emotions. How can you do that? So some of it is how you discuss it, because if you've only heard about fiction like that, you might think it was wrong. So I don't have an answer, but I think some of it might be, I think there's the issues in that framing of like, lots of things we do, do manipulate emotion. Like well, that's, to some extent, a lot of what art is supposed to do is manipulate how you feel or affect you in a particular way. And so the fact that you respond to something that's fiction in some way is, is not bad. But some of it has to do, I guess, with those beliefs. So there's this tension between that suspension of belief and total deception. So there's a, the difference between what is fiction and what is a hoax. And so I think some of it is both that understanding of um, what do they really believe is real, you know, and looking at the comparison of like, and I think also what we don't really understand what the interactivity brings. Because if you brought a teddy bear in, they might also start ascribing a lot of behaviors and characteristics. And you could see kids getting totally heartbroken, like with a favorite teddy bear if it gets like left behind. So, but they know it's not real. So understand what role the interaction itself plays too, I think is important. You know, it's always been clear to me that you see a bigger space than Lots of us see. I mean, when uh, you sort of first talked to you about Mayan being there, and, and right. you sort of got it in a way that lots of folks didn't get it. And, and I'm just wondering today, when you look around, I mean, the, the world has changed a lot, and the internet has changed, and all of that. You know, where are the sort of like interesting parts of that space that people should be looking at but aren't? You know, you know from your perspective. Um, I think a lot of, I mean, certainly I think a lot of this work is just little sketches in directions of things that we just aren't doing. So I think understanding, I think a lot of it is understanding the use of this huge history that we're building. You know, I think a lot of the attention is, is rightly around the privacy aspects, but we're really not doing a good job of using, I mean, there's a lot of really good aspects to using, you know, the archives of what people have said in these archives of conversations and how you build up this history. Um, so I think that's, that's a big piece of it. Um, I think we still, um, our whole interface is very um, limited. You know, I think some of the sense that people have that there's something depressing about people having their entire social life like this is, is a physical element. So I think the, the notion of how do, we inter how do we make our spaces much more interactive, uh, particularly from a social side. So it's not necessarily about the video conferencing, but to say how are the walls and the spaces and the rooms, how do you, how do you become much more embodied again? Um, so interfaces that deal with gesture and, and a physical self, even if it's transformed in some way when you're looking at it, but there's something, there is something very depressing about the sort of disembodiment of interacting in things that bring you smaller and smaller. So I think those are two of the directions I think are interesting. One of the things you mentioned um, early on was talking about metaphors and then bringing along the second and third cousin and a number of the visualizations you present act on some metaphor. I yeah. wonder if you had kind of guidelines or just observations on like the do's and don'ts of picking up a metaphor and deciding to use it, especially in a social social situation. Yeah. Well one example and I go through this a fair amount in my book is a piece that was one of the most requested of my student works. Um, that was a piece called People Garden. 
and it was a visualization of an online discussion and the woman who did it visualized the discussion as a garden and so the longer and so there was, each person was a flower and the longer their stems were the longer they'd been there each of their contributions <coughs> were a flower were, were petals so people contributed a lot were and on the one hand it's a great visualization because you can immediately see we were you know this is again back in in the times of Usenet where you know there's like a hundred different conversations you want to see which are thriving which aren't and so you could see immediately and it was very easy to read because everyone understands a garden and so things with different heights like the more mixed and diverse it was it was really thriving and blah 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 and you could see it really looked like a deserted space when things like people were there for a long time and they had like one petal it just you know <laughs> had that really weedy sense to it and so the metaphor was beautifully but it was an overpowering metaphor because a lot of those discussions were like people calling each other Nazis and you know they were really, really vitriolic but they all came out looking like flowers <laughs> and yeah and so that that's one of my favorite like the do's and don'ts which is that the garden itself was very legible but the literalness wasn't so I think a lot of it is to find the the space between the more literal things are, the easier they to, are to understand, and the more extraneous wrong information <clears> they bring in. So once you have something like that, then you want to think, okay, how far, how can I back off? And you can think, okay, the height is really, really good. The richness of detail is really good. I have to get rid of the flower form. So then I could say, okay, well, if I want to have this height, and I want to have the complexity of the form, but I want to move it like, instead of having petals around a circle, if I can move things off of a different shape, where then the shape itself is abstract, but the effect is you know, enough the same that your knowledge that, okay, that things growing really gives you age is useful, but doesn't bring in flowers. So that's an example. Right. Rely on day to day life. And you mentioned that there were some that emerged in online communities, and that really uh, uh, that seemed very true to me based on the online communities I'm in. But I wondered if you had some examples of that, or um, the examples of how that works differently. I would think it must work much differently. I mean, works at a cognitive level differently, where there's the, uh, the categories are different. You know, for example, there, you mentioned lurkers. Right. It's not the kind of, you know, yeah. You would never okay. Say, you right. Know, oh, that person there hasn't asked the question yet. Yeah. Either, you know, so. Like, that's not something. Yeah. That so I actually had a student <coughs> who wrote a paper as a undergraduate. It was a really nice paper, and you can find it online. And it's like so called something like social roles in Usenet, and it, that's exactly what he was looking for. So he has a whole. So his thesis was a whole enumeration of like newbie and lurker. So the words are different, mm -hmm. but the roles, you know persist and he was interested in finding what are the things that in particular are novel roles and um, I think it is it is really interesting too because there one of the reasons that we have these social roles is you want to know what behaviors you ex are, do you expect from someone and how do you behave towards them and so like a really vivid example from this were, were flamers where people were just going to come in and troll a news group and so one, people had just hadn't seen that kind of behavior before. You just don't normally sit in a conversation and have like a stranger come up and just pretend to be part of your group, and, but they're just there to eventually harass you and turn, like, and turn out in the end that they're just like pulling your leg. It just didn't ha doesn't happen that much over lunch, but it happens a lot <laughs> online. And so it was a type that people had to learn to recognize. And once they had recognized it, so you need this to see what lets you categorize someone that way and then you could see people having discussions about others like is this person this and teachers but then you had to teach you could see the emergence of the social norms around how to behave because the immediate response would be to yell at this person which would then have the effect of completely derailing your conversation and giving them exactly what they wanted whereas the much less intuitive just ignore it no matter how much how provocative it is don't let yourself be provoked was the norm that you had to teach people because it would both disappoint the person who was doing this and it wouldn't de derail your conversation. So that would be an example of something where the more familiar people grew with this type, then the quicker they would also be to recognize those characteristics. So.
Okay. One. Oh, did you have a question? Or? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually thinking about this image right now that you're showing. I'm trying to understand what is the, the ethical question here. I mean, because clearly the toy brought about a positive impact which wasn't there before. Right. And so I am concerned, and I might be wrong, a lot of times these questions probably come from inertia that we have when we, uh, when we are, you know, pose new questions or we see new things as compared to them being really in the gray zone. Right. So, but I think here, and I think is, is that question of where are the uses of that that start getting into a gray zone? So this was meant to be like that ast astroturfing was one extreme where you could say, well, that's probably not You're so good. And this was like the extreme of saying here it's vi it is really hard to see a downside to it. But, you know, is there down, you know, for here, I think for some people it starts to get into a gray zone where you talk about kids. You know, it's a gray zone if it's talking with kids and they're really deceived into thinking it's sentient. You know, so part of the question is to say, wh where do you change that story? <coughs> What's the framing that starts making it gray? What's the framing that says it's bad? What's the framing that says it's fine? So I'm curious, where these questions also raise when cartoons first came up and kids got really involved with cartoon characters and so on and or so forth? Or something like Baby Einstein. Yeah, I think it comes up all the Well, that's why I gave the example. I said, you know, if you'd never heard of fiction, we could raise fiction as a concept. And if you describe fiction and say people get involved with an imaginary character and cry when it dies, but it's actually just words on a page, it sounds pretty awful. Yeah. So yes, you could certainly raise those pieces, but um, you, you want to raise them and say, well, are there spaces? You know, Baby Einstein, it turned out, was, you know, was more like a ethical issue about wasting people's money entirely, but you know, you know, but there, you know, but I think that there's also a level that says, you know, at, because I think the the other the ethical piece I worry about sometimes with these two is not the side that oh you shouldn't shower your affection on an artificial being, but if you if you grow up with a lot of things that you kind of nurture but you know they are artificial and they're things like this then it doesn't matter that you didn't leave the dinner table to feed it. You know, you, you didn't go and feed the Tamagotchi and it died and you didn't care. Does that, do you then have more of a trouble making that next step to the hamster or the gold, you know, to the goldfish? At what point is it good learning or sentience? And at what point do you start desensitizing people to the fact that nurturance is there because something else is helpless. Because these things aren't actually helpless. They're machines. So I think there's, th there are different gray zones in why you're using it and what effect they're having. It could be, though, that the seal, you go the other way. You say, if she broke her leg, you wouldn't hesitate to give her crutches. Right. When, so and I think, this is an emotional, socio-emotional right, so, right, right, and I think in her case, it's the easy case because you know, she's a person who's in a state where you're really just trying to help. Whatever's going to help her, you're not trying to teach her, you're not trying to have her learn. It's, you know, it's just you know, a calming mechanism. But that's where I say, then you start going back. It's different if it's a child. It's different if it's taught as you know, training to nurture. It's different if, if, you, if you're trying to get them to nurture, then you're trying to say, but it's just a machine. Why do we care? You know, but when do you say, it's just a hamster? You know, <coughs> so, I mean, people do, they're gray zones, not black and white zones. But I mean, it seems like you are teaching to nurture as part of what the, the robot's role is. Right. I, I don't think it's just common. For her? For the, that's right. I'm, I'm not sure, yeah, I mean, this, in this particular case, yeah. I mean, I think it, it's, yeah, or maybe that being in a nurturing rural, rural is calming, but the, the point is you're not, this is not someone you're teaching for a future of, of becoming a more nurturing person. Like, a one-year-old isn't that nurturing. Like, you give them something and then they, they'll fling it. You, you're trying to teach a one-year-old to be nur nurturing. A terminal Alzheimer's patient, you're trying to help, but you're not saying she has a future role as a nurturer. I think maybe some of the, some of the dilemmas about placebo you know, medicine could yeah. apply here. Yeah. So like, we have strong evidence that placebo surgeries are you know, really beneficial to people, but what if your insurance company says, Great, like we're going to just cover placebo for surgeries. For right. You know, I'm going to prescribe you to uh, Eliza to talk to yeah. you know, for therapy. And, you know, 
So that kind of brings up like, oh, okay. <laughs> Right, where the Eliza therapy is that now there's a lot more online psychiatry and there's actually a company that's starting to, this is, it's I think particularly salient now because I think there are groups that are trying to reintroduce AI psychology. So, you know, it, it also brings up, if you frame it as saying, you know, if I have a, if I have a diary, like a little diary book that gives me sort of leading questions and I answer them and it's very, reflective. Okay, that's fine. So if that's fine, then if it's a online psychologist, is that fine? But it seems like it's probably unethical if I think it's a person behind there, but it's not. But it's not the simply asking of the questions that's not. But what if I answer those questions better? There's, um, there's a lot of work with human faces and computers. Um, there was work by Lee Sproul and Sarah Kiesler a while ago where they looked at how people respond in the interviews when you, you, you know, when you have your first, those first job interviews where HR is saying, so have you ever stolen any office supplies? And um, it turned out people were much more truthful when they, the interface was very clearly a machine. And they were much less truthful when it was a human face. And their hypothesis is that there's a lot of social lying we do to save face and things that we do to make ourselves look better to other people. And we tend to be just a lot more straightforward with a machine so that you, it's also, you know, ethics aside, there's also the issue, you know, these were clearly not real faces. They knew it was, um, they knew it was both a machine, but just something about a human makes you just want to be on your best behavior, which can also involve lying a bit. So, you know. It's another framing piece. But well, anyway, I think we're out of time. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you.